All right, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today we're going to be looking at the um, the exam that you're going to be coming up with, or that you're going to be taking on next week on Tuesday. And in preparation for the, that exam on the uh, November 26th, I wanted to give you a little bit of an overview on what you'll see on that exam. So you should have received one of these study guides in class on Friday. And there are a bunch of terms and concepts on the first page that you should know. Uh, what it means to be, you know, vertices, even or odd, edges, bridges, graphs, etc. If you look back at your notes, you have all of those terms in your notes. Um, this chart could be filled out if you look back at your notes, the difference between Euler versus Hamilton graphs, um, what it means to end at the vertex where you started, where you actually have a circuit versus a path. Uh, we looked at Euler's theorem, map coloring, complete graphs, complete bipartite graphs, which are like the K5 and the K33 graphs, etc. Weighted graphs with traveling salesperson problem, we looked at a couple algorithms there. We looked at isomorphism, where two graphs are essentially the same thing, planarity, um, the theorem behind planarity, uh, when it can be planar or not, if it contains a K5 or a K33 or not. And then we looked at Euler's formula briefly and some scheduling and ideal marriage problems or stable marriage problems. So we did quite a bit of stuff um, throughout this section. All of the problems within the study guide relate, you know, obviously relate to all these graphs. So I thought I'd just go through each of the problems real quick here and just give a, give a quick to do about what's going on. Hamiltonian circuits. Remember we have this equation for Hamiltonian circuits. Whatever your number is, in case, in this case we have a K8, meaning we have eight eight points all together that are all hitting one another, five, six, seven, eight, and they are all intertwined together. We've got a line, we've got a line, we've got a line. All of them are connected together. I'm not going to draw all connections because there are a ton of them. So instead, I'm just going to go ahead and use this formula where if you start at any point, how many points do you have left? We have seven different options to choose from. If I started with eight points and just started a point, there are seven places I could go. Then there are six places I can go, and then there are five, and four, and three, and two, and one, etc. And so we have this um, n minus one factorial uh, equation that we could use. So eight minus one, eight minus one factorial. Remember, factorials just take the number um, and multiply all the integers underneath it. So, like we were saying, seven times six um, times five times four times three, times two, times one. Whatever that turns out to be, that is an enormous number, so I'm just gonna go ahead and let you calculate that, because I don't have a calculator on me right now, but um, it's, it's gonna be some, some large number. Looking at two through five, we have a graph, and we'd like to identify a few things here. So two, how many edges does it have? Remember, edges are just the lines that are between these points, so we've got one, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve total edges. We have twelve total edges in this thing. Um, which vertices are even or odd? Keep in mind that a vertex, we consider a vertex to be even. If there are an even number of lines coming out of an even number of edges, so this one has two, it has a um, it has a order of two. So um, we, we'd say that that's a even vertex. An odd vertex, for example, let's see where an odd one is. It looks like H is odd because it has three coming out of it. Um, F is going to be odd as well because it has three coming out of it. C is going to be even because it has one, two, three, and four coming out of it. Um, is the graph connected? Yes, it is because you can get from any point to any other point. I can get from G over to A, let's say, by going um, and just traveling G to H, H to F, F to C, C to A. And in fact, I can get from any point to any other point. They're all connected. Does it have any bridges? Keep in mind that a bridge just connects two parts of the graph. If it's the only thing that connects two parts of a graph. So we can see here that we have this portion of the graph and this portion of the graph that is connected by a bridge FH. Um, so, so yes, this graph definitely has some bridges. There's a bridge right there that connects the two pieces of the graph. Scrolling on down here, number six. Um, consider the graphs below, which them can be traced. We could try this out just hands-on and see if we can find a tracing of these 
graphs. Maybe I started F and go F, B, go around, around, around. No, shoot, that didn't work. Maybe there's another way to trace it. Maybe I could start at E and go around. E up there, around. Maybe I'm going to be a little bit more successful. Yes, it looks like I'm a bit more successful with that tracing. So it looks like the set first one can be traced. Can the second one be traced? Let me try. I'm going to go around first, maybe cut over, around, around, cut over. Shoot, I missed a side. That one's not actually going to be traceable. And uh, let me explain why that is exactly. Uh, keep in mind we had this Euler's theorem that said if we have zero or, or two odd vertices, it's traceable. All right. So... If we look at each of these graphs, where are our odd vertices? Nope, that's even, that's even, that's even, that's even. We have an odd one right there, odd one right there, and G is even. So we have two odds, got to be traceable. If we look at this graph, we have an odd there, an odd there, an odd here, and an odd here. We have four odds. It doesn't end up being traceable. We can't uh, draw this whole graph and uh, without picking up our pen um, and not tracing over something twice. So we don't have an Euler path uh, going across this thing. Scrolling on down, as far as coloring goes, if we have a map, suppose this is some some continent. Uh, we've got this kind of circular circular map here, and I would like to determine if this map is indeed um, colorable. I want I want to do a, a coloring of this map with a minimum number of colors. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to devise a way um, by modeling this as a graph first and then devise a way to uh, color it in some way. So I'm going to go ahead and start. I'm actually going to pull up GeoGebra here because GeoGebra is really nice at, at modeling these kind of things. And I'm going to go ahead and just plot my points roughly where they're located. A, B, C, D. We have point E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, and M. Okay, so we have a bunch of points that we've got. Um, I'm going to go and connect all the vertices of the pieces that touch each other. So I see that A shares a border with B, it shares a border with C, E, and J. I'm not going to say it shares a border with F just because it only shares a vertex. All right, it, it shares a vertex, so that's that's fine. So I'm going to connect A to B. I'm going to connect A to C, A to E, and A to J. Next up, I see that B is connected to, it already, I already have it connected to A, so it's connected to C and D. I'm going to go ahead and put those on there as well. I see that C is connected beyond that. C is connected to D. C is also connected to F and G. So I'm going to put those up as well. Um, you see D. D is also connected to H and L. So I'm going to go ahead and connect those as well. A, B, C, D, E. E is connected to F. And J, in addition to the A, I already did. F is connected to I. Everything else is good. A, B, C, D, e, F. G is also connected to I. It's also connected to H. E, F, G, H. It's connected to L. Um, I might go ahead and move this H inside so I don't have some crossing vertices here. All right, what else do we have? H is connected to L, do my alphabet. H, I is connected to K. We don't have that one quite yet. J, K. J is connected to K. J is connected to M. H, I, J, K. L, K is connected to L. K is connected to M. Well, it's connected to M, and I think that is our entire graph. Okay, it's connected to everything. Okay, so we want a coloring of this now. 
We want a coloring of this, and particularly we want to make sure that no two points that are right next to each other um, share the same color. So this is very similar to our you know, zoo problem that we had on our homework. It's very similar to the scheduling problems where we have a bunch of committees that need to meet up. So it's, it's similar to many of these. I'm going to go ahead and draw my colors here with four basic colors. I'm going to go ahead and do orange as my first color. I'm going to do some blue as a color. I'm going to do some pink. I should honestly actually be writing this in blue and pink and such. Key for pink, there we go. And then um, if I need a fourth color, I don't know if I will, I'll go and do a green as well. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and start with my orange. I'm going to say, well, A is orange. A is orange. Um, all right, my second one was blue. Anything that's connected to A, I'm going to go and put as blue if I can. So that's blue. Um, I'm going to go and place a blue one right there. I see that C and J cannot be blue because they're connected with some blue ones. So I'm going to make them pink now. All right, I'm going to make both of those pink. Continuing on, let's go on with the alphabet here. I see D cannot touch blue or pink, but it it's not touching A, so it could be orange. D could be orange, so I'm going to go and just make D orange. Um, going on, I see D, E, I already got F is not touching an orange, so I'm going to go ahead and just do my default lowest value. I'm going to do orange, F, G. G is only touching a pink. It's not touching an orange. I can make that orange as well. Maybe C, D, F, G. H is touching some oranges. I'm going to go and make it touch a blue. I is touching a couple oranges, but it's not touching a blue yet. I'm going to make it touch a blue. H, I, J is all done. K is touching a pink and a blue. It's not touching an orange, so I'm going to default to orange. That's the polar opposite of orange on the color wheel. There we go. Um, H, I, J, K, L is touching an orange and a blue and an orange. That's totally fine. We can make it a pink. And it looks like M could potentially be a blue because it's not a blue, but it's touching an orange and pink. So we're able to color this graph actually in just three colors. We did not even need a green in this example, which is pretty nice. You can go to a, show, a store, buy some paint, and you only need to purchase three colors of paint in this example. You don't need a full four colors of paint. And then you can just start uh, playing, playing coloring like uh, back in elementary school. You can go in color A. Orange, I'm not going to do the whole thing, but you can color um, B as blue, you could color D as orange, etc. And you're not going to end up getting two, color, two countries that are colored in the same color that are touching each other. Pretty neat, huh? Moving on down, um, find all Hamiltonian circuits that start with A and go through B. That's just a matter of listing off a few. I'm going to list a few for you and then you can choose the rest. This is going to go A over to B. Um, I'm going to do the easy one, then maybe we do C, D, E. All right. Maybe we could do um, A to B, and then we could go from B to D, C, E. All right. Um, A to B to C to E to D. That's a possibility. And by the way, with all these, I'm wrapping up by going back to A. That, that should be noted that all of these are going to A in the end. So that's three of them. There are several more. I'm going to let you go ahead and find the rest of those. But there are, there are a few. In fact, there are three that can be ordered. So that's going to be a um, choice of three factorial different solutions. There's going to be a total of six possible ways you could do this. And I'm sure you can find the other, the other three. Scrolling on down, suppose we have this uh, K5 graph. It's all weighted. I want to find a minimum weight with this graph. Now, if we do brute force method, remember brute force is just trying every single circuit until we find something that works. All right, every single circuit until we find something that works. It's, it's, it's the most time consuming of the, of the methods. And here's, here's why. I could potentially start drawing over this thing and say, well, um, where should I go? A, I, I can just start kind of willy-nilly picking some. Here's a 
few pieces. I don't want to, I can't take a three, otherwise I'm back to a circuit. So maybe I'll take this four path and this four path. So if I add up all of these, I have a four plus a four is an eight, plus two is 10, plus a uh, one is 11, plus two, 13. So that's a 13. Um, in order to do all of the paths, I mean, cl clearly I'm not going to want to take the 8, right? Let, let's go and ignore this path completely. Brute force is going to say, well, let, let's, just, let's just not even take the 8 because I need four other, uh, four other edges to include in my circuit, so, so that's not going to work. Um, maybe I start at A and maybe I go down here. Let's try another path. What if I take the 3, 1, 5, 4 instead? So I took the 4, 5, 3, 1, 3. 4, 5, 3, 1, 3. I had a 4 plus a 5 is a 9. The two 3s make a 6. 6 plus 9 is a 15 plus a 1. I'm already at 16. That's a few too many. That's a few too many. I bet I'm going to get my best as 13. Um, brute force, you can just keep on looking at these if you want, but it's it's going to take a little while to, to find the best solution. I bet 13 is the best. I don't honestly know, but let's uh, let's find out with the nearest neighbor best edge algorithm, see if they agree with us. Nearest neighbor, I'm going to start at A. I'm going to go my nearest neighbor route, which is 2, because all the other paths are 4, 6, and 3. I'm going to go 2. Nearest neighbor from C is over to E. Nearest neighbor from E is over to D. Um, I don't want to complete a path, so, so I'm actually going to get the same thing that I did with my brute force initially. And I'm going to say that um, nearest neighbor generated a 13. Remember with nearest neighbor, I'm just choosing the smallest path, smallest path, smallest path, smallest path, and I go from there. So 13 with nearest neighbor algorithm. Let's see if the, the greedy algorithm gives us anything different. Remember greedy is just pick the smallest path, so I'm going to pick smallest path as 1, smallest path as 2, Smallest path is 2. None of those paths so far have generated a circuit yet, so we're safe. Next smallest path, I could try to grab this 3, but this edge already has been met, so I don't need to grab the 3. I see a 3 right here, but I can't grab that one, because um, that would make a full circuit. That doesn't work. I'm going to go ahead and choose to grab a 4 instead then, so I'm going to grab this 4 here. That doesn't make a full circuit yet, but if we go and connect the last bit, it does make a full circuit. In fact, we get the same circuit again. Um, so it looks like we're pretty much doomed to use this weighted 13 path, the uh, 24412 path, um, using either the nearest neighbor or best edge algorithm. And I think I think that's honestly the best path. I don't think we're going to find anything else brute force-wise. There would be a better path than that. Last couple problems. Um, one, doing the uh, marriage algorithm, the uh, stable marriage algorithm, one with the scheduling algorithm. Let's look at the scheduling one first and then the uh, um, stable marriage algorithm. We'll actually look at a situation that, um, um, that many medics, medical student candidates face where they're finding their residencies and there's a matching algorithm. So we'll be looking at a, that uh, matching algorithm here. Um, but so far as the scheduling algorithm goes, um, suppose we need to schedule a bunch of arts classes at SPCPA, and we want as many as, or as few periods as possible, obviously. We don't want to have a 20-period day at SPCPA. We also want to create a conflict-free schedule. This is another one where GeoGebra is going to be insanely helpful. Um, what we can do here with, with GeoGebra, um, I'm going to go ahead and delete what I had prior to this. I'm going to, if I can, drag this over. Here we go. And hopefully this will work with GeoGebra where, um, hmm. actually, you know what, I'm just going to freehand this graph, whatever. I can freehand this graph. Um, and I'm actually just going to get you started on this graph. Freehanding, honestly, on this computer is not that great. So. So suppose this is theory. I'm just going to label it theory. Theory cannot be 
associated with jazz band, vocal jazz, dance, improv, and chamber ensemble because we have students who take theory who also take these other courses. We can't have them all um, interfering with each other. So what we're going to do here is connect theory to those four other courses um, between jazz band, uh, vocal jazz, um, dance improv, and chamber ensemble. All right, so we're set with theory. Singing ensemble, it looks like singing ensemble does interfere with dance improv, vocal jazz, um, theater studies, and theory. So we have a new thing that's interfering with these three other things. It looks like singing ensemble interferes with those things, theory, uh, dance improv, vocal jazz, and theater studies is something that we haven't done yet. Um, so we'll go and connect that in that manner. Check that off. Cabaret interferes with several things, film studies, etc. You're in, you're going to end up having like you know, 20 points or something like that. Um, um, so so you, you get the idea. You'll be continuing on this graph. And then just like the coloring problem that we did previously um, with this problem, you're going to go ahead and do the same exact thing. Um, I'm, you're going to go ahead and color them like, oh, well, maybe this is blue. This one I'm going to color green. This one's unaffected, so I'm going to color it blue. I can color this one blue as well. I can color this one blue as well. This one's going to need to be green. This one can be blue probably. I'm assuming that these aren't connected, but they might be future in the, in the future here. So, um, so it'll, it'll just be like the uh, map problem they did. Last one up, uh, medical schools, like I said, medical schools and residency programs do match their students with uh, what's called the stable marriage algorithm. Um, so suppose we have five different students, L, B, K, D, and Eli, um, incidentally named A, B, C, D, and E. And they're applying to the U of M, Sioux Falls, Iowa, Nebraska, and Illinois. They're trying to get into all of these programs. Uh, they've ranked their programs, and the programs have ranked them. We want to try to find an ideal combination between residents and their residencies. Um, so here's what we can do. We're going to create a uh, K55 bipartite graph like we've done in the past. And I'm going to go ahead and draw that out up top here with the space that I have. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and label all of our students here. Here's Here's Al, B, K, D, and Eli. All right, I'm going to actually zoom out a little bit so we can get a better version of that. Al, B, oh, that's, that's too bad. You know what we're going to do? We're just going to go ahead and mark straight on this. There we go. All right, so here we've got enough space. Um, we have L that we need to connect. We have B that we need to connect. We have K that we need to connect. We have D, and we have Eli. And all of these folks need to be connected to um, some, some residency programs. So let's go and get a couple of columns going. Do a column work. Here we go. They need to be connected to U of M. Sioux Falls, um, Iowa, Nebraska, and Illinois. All right. So the way, with the way the residency program works, the, um, the, it's the students that are actually favored in the residency program. They're the ones that technically, quote unquote, propose to their, uh, to their potential programs. Um, so, so we're going to have all of our students propose first. I'm going to represent that by taking Al. Al is going to propose to U of M. B is going to propose to Sioux Falls. K is going to propose to Nebraska. Um, D is going to propose to Sioux Falls as well. And Eli is going to propose to the U of M. All right, so we have a couple of double proposals here. We have a couple double proposals. Um, because of that, going to cause a little bit of an issue. 
Um, U of M is only going to accept one person. U of M has Al as their first priority. All right. So they're actually going to get rid of Eli's uh, proposal altogether. All right. They're going to get rid of Eli's proposal altogether, and they're going to keep Al. In Sioux Falls, it looks like B and D are both proposing. Um, Sioux Falls can't get Al, but B is their number one priority, so they are going to snag B as their proposal. And then K proposed in Nebraska, even though K is not their ideal candidate, they're going to say, okay, K, that's totally fine. Um, as a round two, so that was, that was in blue, I have round one. In round two, I'm going to go ahead and do that in red. Anybody who hasn't proposed or hasn't been matched is going to propose now. D is going to propose to our second choice, which is U of M. U of M is going to say, nope, we already have Al, who's our first choice, so heck with UD, that doesn't work. Eli is going to propose to his second choice, which is Nebraska. Nebraska is going to say, hey, Eli, we really like you. We like you more than we like K, so we're going to get rid of K. All right. Eli is the new front runner. So we're going to get rid of K. K is no more. So um, K has already proposed, excuse me, K has already proposed in Nebraska. Um, Eli has already proposed to U of M in Nebraska. And we can start checking, checking a few of these off as we go. All right, so round three. Round three, we're going to go and flip over to orange for round number three. Round three, it looks like K and D are the ones that are not connected to anybody. K can propose to Sioux Falls. All right, K is going to propose to Sioux Falls here. Sioux Falls is going to say, well, we like B a lot better. We like our candidate a lot better than we currently have. So K, sorry, you can't be our new candidate. D is going to propose to U of M, but same thing, D is going to propose to U of M. U of M says, nope, we like Al a lot better. Sorry, D, you're not our ideal candidate. You can't be it. So that's unfortunate. D and K both did not get their next choice. All right, that's totally fine. They're both going to propose to Iowa next. So I'm going to go and switch over to green here. Round four. K and D are both going to propose to Iowa now. Iowa is going to choose one of them, looking at Iowa. Looks like Iowa likes K better. So they're going to get rid of the D proposal. K is connected. D did not get Iowa. D is going to propose to Nebraska next. Um, this is going to be round five here. I'm going to go and just um, highlight it in, goodness, what other colors do I have? Shoot. Oh, no, I lost everything. Um, well, I think we had Eli going to Nebraska. I think these two were going straight over, if I remember right. I think K proposed to Iowa. And then D had to connect with somebody. D was going to, was going to propose to Nebraska next. Um, Nebraska is going to say, nope, we like Eli. Heck with you, D. Um, poor D is going to go ahead and just go over to Illinois. Illinois says, well, D, we like you all right, even though it's your fifth, even though you're our fifth, or um, we were your fifth choice, we like you plenty, and none of the other programs liked you any, so we're going to go ahead and just snag you here. So Illinois says, D, we like you plenty, let's connect. And that's going to be our stable marriage. Um, Al's going to U of M, B's going to Sioux Falls, K's going to Iowa, D's going to Illinois, and Eli's going to Nebraska. Once we have our stable marriage, you can look at all of the pairings, all of the possible pairings, and you discover that there are no pairings where both partners prefer each other over the person they originally got. All right? So that's what we call stable then, that um, everybody got their ideal as best they could. I mean, if they weren't a great candidate, like D was not a great candidate, so it's understandable that D didn't end up getting any of her first four choices because all of the other programs had candidates that they liked more. It's unfortunate. It happens. Whatever. Um, so that's all I've got going on. Be sure to email me if you have questions. I'll be around after school on Monday for extra help if you need it. Have a delightful day.